and welcome back to the Cryptomatic Podcast. I'm your host, Dominic Wallenzak, and this week we have a special discussion for you today. So we had an interesting call several shifts back uh, that I found to be a rather unique experience, and unfortunately it was also a rather sad experience, but uh, we're never one to miss a uh, learning opportunity, so I think it's very beneficial to uh, take the time to review exactly what went down in this call and uh, what could be done to improve patient care in the future. So in particular on this call, we arrived on scene with a volunteer fire company to find a gentleman in his 70s seated on his couch, gray and profoundly diaphoretic, complaining of difficulty breathing. Uh, fire reports that the patient took all of his medications. And uh, by all of his medications, I mean he took all of his medications. Uh, approximately two months worth of his ajoxin, carvedilol, lisinopril, acetaminophen, and aspirin, approximately 90 minutes ago. Um, on assessment, his radio pulse rate was immediately noted to be in the high 20s to low 30s, but his blood pressure was auscultated at 190 over 80, so that was actually fairly remarkable. Uh, he reports it was an intentional overdose uh, after his wife of nearly 50 years left him. Uh, we called to the outlying hospital and discussed whether they had sufficient digibind, and the discussion was that they didn't have enough in stock to be able to treat this patient adequately. So we transported to a larger regional facility some 30 minutes distant. Uh, on the way, we started a large bore IV and uh, administered 2 milligrams of glucagon. Uh, we also dropped an NG tube and tried to evacuate whatever contents we could at, at that point. And when the pressure dropped into the 70s, uh, we also initiated some transcutaneous pacing to try and uh, improve some cardiac output a little bit. And to my surprise, actually, we managed to get uh, decent mechanical and electrical capture. Uh, and that was confirmed not only with uh, palpable pulses, but also with photoplethysmography. So we also, um, you know, prepared to uh, start like an epinephrine drip. And our thought behind that was our typical agent is norepinephrine, but regular epinephrine has more chronotropic properties. It's got alpha and beta to it as well. So... Uh, epinephrine might be better in that situation, so that, that was our standpoint. We didn't end up starting it because with the pacing, everything actually uh, improved. Um, he remained uh, somewhat hypoxic throughout. He wasn't really tolerating a mask, so we did the best we could with either a blow-by or nasal cannula, but even so, he still remained a little bit on the low side. Uh, ultimately, this might be a good candidate for DSI if your agency has that, but that was not an option that was uh, available to us. So, <clears throat> in addition to this, um, you know, we got him to the point where we we're looking at maybe some sedation, maybe ultimately intubation, um, but uh, we never got uh, ultimately to that stage before we arrived at the hospital. So we delivered him conscious, talking, decent blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, Twenty minutes later, he had coded, and they tried to resuscitate him with. Uh, with calcium, with uh, 80 units of insulin, and 2 amps of D50, but ultimately they were unsuccessful. So we're going to have a guest to join us today to break this down and look at all the aspects of this. I think it's going to be an interesting evening. State. Joining us today, we have Dr. Michael Holland, a professor of emergency medicine at SUNY Upstate, a clinical toxicologist at Upstate New York Poison Control Center in Syracuse, and the regional medical director for the Advanced Hazmat Life Support course up here in the Northeast. Dr. Holland, welcome aboard. Thank you for having me. So you've had a chance to go over the presentation uh, of this patient. What are some of your immediate concerns uh, for this uh, initial presentation? Okay, so um, I was very concerned, obviously, with that severe bradycardia and not unexpected given the medicines he overdosed on, the car carvedilol combined with the joxin. But I was really surprised that his blood pressure was so high, and, and I'm uh, afraid that that wouldn't last. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, it didn't last too much longer into the transport. Uh, the, the pressure did uh, precipitously decline. 
So as far as uh, a digoxin overdose, uh, what kind of impact does it have on the patient? What's the, the mechanism and the pathogenesis behind it? Okay, so um, digoxin works uh, by increasing vagal tone, so it can sh slow the heart rate, and it also um, poisons the, uh, blocks the uh, sodium potassium ATPase pump, which pumps potassium intracellularly and sodium out, exchanging one for one. So when you poison that pump, you can't pump sodium out of the cell or keep the uh, in the cell, so it, it leaks out. And so um, one of the uh, harbingers of a severe digoxin overdose is when someone has a, an elevated serum potassium. In the days before Digibind, that was one of the markers. If someone took an acute overdose of digoxin and their serum potassium was above 5.5, it was universally fatal. So that was a good indicator that it was a significant overdose. And so in a case like this, you would think that, that uh, his serum potassium would be elevated. And if it is, you, it's an indication for immediate um, administration of digibind, uh, as long as, as well as his severe bradycardia is most likely due to the uh, digoxin as well. So uh, you mentioned uh, digibind as one of the treatments. So what are some of the other treatments that are typically used for uh, digoxin overdose and some of the associated sequela? Okay, so you can try atropine, obviously, to try and speed up the heart rate. Um, and that sometimes works a little bit and often not. You can also try, um, you know, if you need to speed the heart rate up, a, a, a chronotropic agent like uh, epinephrine uh, or isoprel, but that often doesn't work either. And especially in this case, with a combined overdose of carbidolol, which is a beta blocker, and it also has alpha blockade properties, uh, it's not likely to have much effect either. So I would try atropine, I would try, um, um, you know, uh, those other measures, but you may need to go, like you did, uh, go to a pacer. So with carvedilol in the mix, how does carvedilol by itself impact the patient, and what are some of the treatments for a beta blocker overdose? Okay, so carvedilol, as I mentioned, is a you know, non-selective beta blocker, but it also has alpha blocking properties somewhat. And so um, when you lose your alpha tone, that's your squeeze of the blood, blood vessels. And so that, that would uh, contribute to hypotension. And so you're going to have a, a low heart rate and low blood pressure with carvedilol. And combined with the oxygen, that's really, you know, double whammy um, against, uh, you know, the heart rate so that's why he was you know so profoundly great at cardiac um as you had mentioned that you gave some um glucagon and that's uh, one of the treatments for a beta blocker overdose because it when you stimulate the beta receptor on the cell it it increases intracellular cyclic amp and that affects the you know increasing the heart rate so um when your beta receptor is blocked, you can stimulate intracellular uh, cyclic AMP by using glucagon. And so it bypasses the blocked uh, beta receptor. It, it only has a temporizing uh, effect because it doesn't last that long. And you need to give it in like 10 milligram doses. Um, and um, the problem with that is most hospitals don't have a large stock of many ampules of uh, glucagon and you would quickly run out while we're treating these uh, overdoses. So one of the adjunct therapies I've heard uh, used for beta blocker overdose is something like calcium. Um, is there any concern with using calcium in the context of a uh, digoxin overdose? Hey, good, good, uh, good pickup. Yes, that there is because uh, one of the treatments for uh, you know non-specific, you know, there's a high potassium, a hyperkalemia, is to stabilize the myocardial membranes by giving calcium. Um, however, the, the way digoxin works for increasing its uh, um, inotropy is it affects intracellular calcium. And there's this thing called the stone heart that they, they saw in uh, dog models, animal models, m many decades ago, where they had a digoxin overdose. And then uh, when they gave calcium, it, it froze the heart in systole and didn't relax to diastole. So it was like a stone heart stuck in systolic contraction. Uh, that's never been shown in humans, and we don't know that it really uh, happens. And people that were given calcium um, in the hospital for severe hyperkalemia that they didn't know at the time was due to a digoxin overdose, 
none of them exhibited the stone heart. Um, there was a recent study by Levine in the last couple of years in the emergency medicine literature said it would uh, imply that that's not really a fear, but um, people are still very cautious about it. Um, and the reason you give uh, calcium intravenously in high potassium because it helps stabilize the myocardium from the arrhythmias. And there's no evidence that giving calcium in the setting of a digoxin overdose is going to have the salutary effect of stabilizing the myocardial membranes like it does in you know generic hyperkalemia. So it's really not sure it actually works. Now, probably this is the least of the patient's concerns, but is there any concern about uh, phlebitis effects from uh, giving intravenous uh, calcium via peripheral IV? Yes, that's a good point. So <clears throat> you really can't give calcium chloride through a peripheral IV. You have to give that through a central line or a huge, you know, large bore vein. And even then you, there's a risk of phlebitis. So we would use calcium gluconate because it, it only has uh, a, you know, a very small percentage compared to calcium chloride because the gluconate molecule is so large, but it, it does deliver calcium. So it's much safer to give that um, intravenously by a uh, peripheral line. Now, some of the other medications that this patient uh, overdosed on, uh, you know, obviously the, the main concerns are the digoxin and the carvedilol. Uh, but what about the lisinopro and the acetaminophen and the aspirin? What kind of effects do they have on, on the patient? Okay, so um, the lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor, you know, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And so that's how it works for lowering blood pressure. And um, typically isolated in overdose, um, ACE inhibitors are not all that serious in overdose. And and they, you know, may cause some hypotension that's usually treated with fluids and they do very well. But I think, you know, the, you have this severe bradycardia that's due to the digoxin and carbetalol. Then you have the hypotension from the bradycardia as well as the carbetalol blocking the alpha receptors. And then you have uh, lisinopril on top of that. That, that. All those things are having synergistic effects for, for him to bottom out his blood pressure. Um, I think the acetaminophen and, and aspirin wouldn't, uh, so much affect those initially. Now, uh, with the lisinopril, uh, is there a concern for like a runaway bradykinin reaction? Yeah, that's a good question because bradykinin reactions usually happen during therapeutic use of of the ACE inhibitors, and um, because the angiotensin converting enzyme is the same enzyme that breaks down bradykinin, and so when you when you are an ACE inhibitor you have excess circulating bradykinin and they can get those bouts of angioedema. Um, but typically you don't see that due to an overdose. It's usually someone who's therapeutically on it and they just develop these bouts of it. Now, as far as the, the acetaminophen overdose, that's probably not more of an immediate management concern, correct? That's correct. Yeah, good point. Um, that was a, be a concern where you, you if you note the time of ingestion, you would get a uh, serum level, um, you know, four hours afterwards. And, and then you can plot that on the nomogram and, and know whether you need to give anecdotal therapy with the N-acetylcysteine. All right. And how about, how about aspirin, uh, aspirin overdoses? What kind of effects do they have on a patient? Okay. Initially aspirin overdoses will have a serum, um, uh, that somewhat serum acidosis because of the, uh, uh, um, the actual aspirin, the salicylic acid. So you'll have a metabolic acidosis, but you'll have a rel relatively profound respiratory alkalosis because what happens, the, um, the aspirin stimulates the respiratory drive center in, uh, in your brainstem. And so you do it, they do hyperpnic, you know, in other words, their respiratory rate is fairly, fairly rapid, but it's extremely deep. So they're very deep in and out. But um, uh, if the acidosis gets worse, that's going to make the hyperkalemia worse and um, all sorts of things. And then when you get more acidotic, you get more um, aspirin. The salicylate ion will transfer into the brain um, and you'll get a uh, worsening of the overdose. Now, is there a concern with, uh, if this patient ultimately needs to be intubated, is there a concern about uh, the minute volume that needs to be administered? Absolutely. So um, you have to preserve that metabolic, I mean, that respiratory alkalosis. So their respiratory drive is what's, uh, taking over and it's actually has a, having a protective effect against the metabolic acidosis. So if you do have to intubate a, a, a aspirin overdose patient, you have to be very careful and monitor the blood gases and make sure you're still blowing off the CO2 and you're keeping them um, alkalemic 
uh, relatively um, because we've seen a number of deaths where someone's paralyzed, intubated, sedated, and they're put on normal vent settings and they relatively quickly crash and die from the, uh, the acidosis and induced uh, salicylate transfer into the brain. This sounds like uh, what Dr. Weingart was talking about in his uh, podcast on the laryngoscope as a murder weapon. <laughs> yeah, it can be dangerous. So about 90 minutes post-ingestion, what are your thoughts about the use of like a nasogastric tube to try and aspirate some of the uh, the stomach contents? I imagine at 90 minutes the, the pill content has already liquefied. Would a nasogastric tube uh, have some effect at uh, reducing some of the overdose uh, effects? It, it, uh, nasogastric tube wouldn't be big enough, obviously, to bring up any tablets or, or fragments or, or pills. So um, you would have to uh, rely on it all being dissolved into some liquid form and get up and there's very little that would be removed that way. Um, what happens a lot of times in overdose, pills tend to can certain medicines even more than others, but they can kind of try to congeal and, and form like a little mass or a mini beeswax. And so they're not even amenable to um, getting it up with a oral gastric hose, a large tube. So a nasogastric tube wouldn't work. A nasogastric tube is used sometimes when we have an overdose of a liquid medication. If it's very quick after they overdose on it, and it may be something that's severely uh, toxic and life-threatening, and you might try it, but it's it's rarely used anymore because it's really not effective. Speaking of things that aren't used too much anymore, at least in the EMS setting, uh, what about uh, things like activated charcoal? Would that be effective at uh, reducing the absorption of the, uh, at least the, the joxin? Yes. I mean, think if you see someone who, you know, you know they just took a uh, potentially dangerous uh, overdose and you have activated charcoal and it's relatively soon after, then a, an oral dose of charcoal is a good idea if the person's waking up and alert and can drink it. Um, when someone whose uh, heart rate's in the 20s and they may be sort of an extremist, we, we, we don't usually give it because we, you know, they can cr crash and burn pretty quickly. And then, um, you know, they might aspirate or vomit and, and it can cause, uh, you know, more problems than it that can solve. Sounds like these patients are probably best served to be uh, NPO in that case. Yeah, I think so. Speaking of alternate uh, feed mechanisms, uh, what are your, are your thoughts with trying to uh, lipid bind uh, some of the various toxins by administering uh, lipid containing solutions? Oh, that's a good a good point. So, so if we go back to the sequence of kind of how you, you know, you were taking care of them, the glucagon seemed to work initially, but didn't quite have enough enough uh, dose. Then, then when they when uh, if they start to brought, lose their blood pressure, you would do pressors and you do high dose insulin euglycemic therapy. So in other words, give one dose, one, uh, um, uh, excuse me, one unit of insulin IV per kilo, and then run that per hour and, um, and keep their, keep, keep giving D25 or D50 to keep their glucose, um, up. Um, you had mentioned some calcium. Sometimes that can work in a, a calcium channel overdose, a calcium channel blocker overdose, but not, not usually very effective in beta blocker, but, but um, in some of these um, cases, when they're really crashing and you're, you're, you're running pressors and you're running um, insulin and glucose and they're still not, it's still not effective, the intralipid that is used in hyperam alimentation, it's, it's made from a soybean and egg yolk mixture and it, it looks like milk. It's white, milky stuff. And we often will run that in because the theory is that it provides lipids that the heart uses for, for its metabolic, metabolic needs. And so it boosts that. Plus, they think it can sequester some lipid soluble drugs and bring bring them out of the tissues into the uh, lipid fraction in the blood. And 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 some there's been a number of case reports where this has these have been life saving. So yeah, I would I would try that in this patient. So you mentioned the use of some pressor agents. Uh, typically, the most common pressors that we have available on the ambulance is uh, norepinephrine. Uh, would epinephrine be more uh, ideally situated for its chronotropic effects in this patient? Yeah, that might be more, that potentially more effective, but if there's a significant carbidolol blocking of the beta receptor, it may not have much effect. But um, there's often times where we try two pressors. You might have ep norepinephrine and epinephrine running at the same time. I see. 
Uh, what about vasopressin? Would that uh, would that have a beneficial impact uh, on the patient? Yes, because that goes by that that uh, mechanism by the V1 receptors, and so that's a, actually a different mechanism that's not blocked. So that can also be effective, and we have used that as well. So hypothetically, if you were instead of being Doctor Holland, if you were a paramedic Holland, how would you optimize the care of this patient in the pre-hospital setting? Well, I think um, he, I, there was absolutely no uh, criticism on my part when I read your uh, scenario because this is someone who is potentially uh, going to crash and burn very quickly, and you did all the right things. Um, if you had access to digibine, that might, you know, that could potentially be life saving if you could get that um, early on. But uh, no EMS, you know, uh, rigs that I know of have it, and it's you know extremely expensive, but. I think the thing to do is you you try and go to a hospital that had digibine available, and that's the right thing to do. Now, when I saw this patient and I heard the the just the quantities of medications that he had ingested, my initial thoughts as far as his overall mortality is I thought he had a likely ninety percent chance of uh, mortality in this particular case. Oh, just subjectively, what would you estimate his overall survival likelihood and mortality likelihood to be? Yeah, I, I think um, that's probably a good guess. I, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I, uh, that's probably 90% probably good. I mean, the, unfortunately, you know, some people, no matter what we do, they die from their overdose because they just take enough that you can't do anything. There's just not enough antidote. And so many things that people take, don't don't have an antidote um, for Dig. If Dig was the main, um, you know, um, culprit here, the Digibine might have made a difference. But he had such profound bradycardia and hypotension, along with you know probably this Dig effect. And um, you know there were so many things stacked against him. I think your guesstimate of ninety percent mortality uh, initial on your initial guess was probably very accurate. And unfortunately, sometimes all the supportive care and antidotes you can give just don't work because the patient just took too much. If if this patient were to somehow survive their overdose, what sort of downstream effects could we potentially see on like an interfacility transfer of this patient? Would this be a patient who would be well su suited for say a dialysis therapy? Okay, well that's a good question. Now, so certainly for for salicylate, if, if the salicylate level comes back and it's very high and needs dialysis, it salicylates very uh, readily removed by hemodialysis. Unfortunately, the other drugs aren't carbetalol and um, and digoxin uh, are not removed by dialysis because most of that uh, drug is distributed into the tissues and it's not existing in the central compartment where it's readily available to dialyze out of the blood. So I think toxicological emergencies and situations are actually quite fascinating. If uh, some paramedics would like to learn some more information about toxicolo toxicological emergencies and how they're managed, is there a certain course that they could take? And uh, if so, when is the next upcoming information session that they could uh, attend to uh, you know, learn more about uh, toxicological emergencies? Well, it's, it's funny you should mention that this time of the year, we always have an annual toxicology teaching day, day at SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse. And it's uh, run by the Department of Emergency Medicine and the uh, Upstate New York Poison Center. And this year's course is on November 7th. And we've had paramedics, uh, nurses, um, medical students, uh, residents, um, tendings, um, everyone, all are welcome. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, we usually have a theme each year of uh, certain things, but there's generally um, some um, cutting edge type things. And there's, it's, I, I think uh, uh, paramedics have been, attended it in the past and have enjoyed it. So I, I would recommend looking into that. Sounds like an outstanding opportunity for paramedics. Dr. Holland, thank you so much for joining us and taking time to break down the situation. It's, I think it's an interesting case study and, you know, unfortunately, uh, one that we all wish had a, a better outcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Dominic.